I'm not look I'll turn this way and say it so you don't think I'm talking to you, okay? The Holy Spirit has brought you here today to hear from God. He brought you here to hear something from God. And God wants to talk to you today. He has something for you for you to know. He has something that he wants to deliver to you through his word. When I was a kid growing up, I remember the first preacher I ever heard, his name was Orville Hubbard. And I remember him getting fired up. Now I was little, but I remember him getting fired up. There's one thing though, he said always that I always remember him saying. At the beginning of his sermon and sometimes at the end, he would say, this is your hour of decision. This is your hour of decision. And I was little, but I remember that. I'm going to put it this way. What is the Lord saying to you? What is the Lord saying to you? And what are you going to do about it today? Sometimes He's saying stuff we just have to receive. Sometimes He wants to deliver peace when there is no peace. And sometimes He wants to deliver peace in the midst of chaos. And He'll do it. But we have to be willing to receive it. We have to say, God, I know, I want you to know that I know you're my only hope. I want you to know that I know you're my only hope. Sometimes He wants to deliver a challenge. Sometimes He's wanting to move us off of where we're at. Sometimes He's saying, hey, you need to stop keeping one foot on one side of the fence and one on the other. Sometimes He's saying, pick a side. You want some backup for that? He told a church, the church in Laodicea, He said, pick a side, because you're not hot, you're not cold. Pick a side. I wish you were one or the other. So there's biblical background for Him to challenge us and say, pick a side. Which side are you going to be on? And sometimes He just needs to deliver that, that knowing that reinforcement. He's absolutely there. Understand that in our pursuit of being disciples, in our pursuit of being disciples, it's okay to go, I'm not sure what He's saying to me. It's okay to say, I'm not quite sure what He's saying to me. Let me say that one more time. It's not, it's, it's not wrong to say, I'm not quite sure what God is saying to me. Question is, what is He saying to you? And are you listening, right? So in that, we're going to look at, a, at two really close disciples today who were unclear. They're unclear on the resurrection. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, to Luke chapter 24 and hold it there. It's a fascinating, well, actually it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, the road to Emmaus. Jesus comes up in his resurrected body and he comes alongside a couple of people. Most think it's a husband and wife walking from Jerusalem back to, to, to Emmaus, a little town outside of Jerusalem. And they didn't recognize him. These were followers of Jesus and they didn't recognize him. They watched Him die on the cross, these two, and they didn't recognize Him. So that's what we're going to look at today. But <clears throat> even then, sometimes with His disciples, and we'll see, with His disciples, with His disciples, these are the people closest to Him, His disciples, there were deniers. They were going, I, I don't, Thomas said, I don't think He did it. I don't think, I'm, I'll only believe it when I can put my finger through His hand. Right? That He was a denier. In... And we, and we go, I can't believe that, you know? Sometimes we look at that and we go, I can't believe he did that. He was there. But let me give you an example, two examples of, of denying. There are people, there are people, there are people walking the planet today that deny there was a moon landing. You can look at the moon landing when, man, when the United States sent a man to the moon, we put them successfully on the moon. We have pictures to prove that we went to the moon. Not only do we have pictures, we have rocks. If you've been to the Smithsonian Institution, you can see the rocks. We have the space capsule that took these men to the moon and brought them back again. 
Some of those are in the Smithsonian Institute as well. We have the spacesuits that the men who went to the moon wore and brought back. And yet there are people who go, I don't think that happened. You know what that was? That was that, they staged all that in a movie studio. And there are people to this day that will fight you to the death, <laughs> verbally. They're going, that never happened. And you go, whoa. You know? Because we've all seen it. Or we've seen evidence of it. We've seen proof of it. There's proof that it happened. And there are people going, I don't know. That didn't happen. Let me give you another one. Austin, hit that next slide. There's our proof. There are also people today, and I am not making this up. In fact, Melissa, our oldest daughter, called me one day and said, Dad, what do you say to somebody? And they're absolutely serious. What do you say to somebody when they tell you the earth is flat? And I said, no. She said, yes. I said, they're really serious? Yes. And they get mad when you tell them they're wrong. <laughs> and there's a society called the Flat Earth Society. And they're, they, evidence to the contrary, and they're going, yes, the earth is flat. And it's taken us back 600 years, you know, going, I don't know. Now, sometimes God will bring to me stuff, examples, and I, and I was using the example of Melissa. And then I sent this, because last night, um, I'm on Twitter, and this article popped up from Forbes magazine. Two-thirds of American millennials believe the earth is round. Put this this other way. 35% of American millennials think the earth is flat. I'm just as amazed as you are, right? <laughs> so, and this article goes through here, and it's got the the responses and stuff like that. Of adults 18 to 24 years of age, 35% of them will fight you. If you say the earth is round, they'll go, no, it's not. I'll leave this here as evidence if you want to look at this. So there are flat earth deniers, but there are also resurrection deniers to this day. There were resurrection deniers at the time that Jesus came up out of the grave. And there are resurrection deniers today. They go, no, it didn't happen. He either wasn't really dead. His disciples stole his body. I mean, all the things that you've heard. And over 580 people saw him after the resurrection. He wasn't a ghost. He was Jesus in his new body. And it'll be like the kind of body we will have someday. We'll have this new body. And yet there were deniers. And you go, well, why do people deny? How can this be? If there's evidence to the contrary, if there's evidence, go back to, the, to that. If there's evidence to say the world is round and we really were there, there's evidence that Jesus really did. How can they get to this? Well, the thing is, is that sometimes, sometimes, there's either a missing part of the truth, either somebody hasn't been told the truth, or there's physical circumstances that seem to be contrary to what was of the truth, right? There's physical. And sometimes in our physical circumstances, we go, God's not listening to me. I'm praying and he's not hearing me talk. I keep praying the same prayer and he's not answering the prayer. Sometimes the physical circumstances in which we live right now, we're going, God, I keep praying and you're not answering. And so with this, we find two disciples. We take that thought here, and let's look at the Word of God. Because the Word of God, God doesn't hide from us people that go, I, I don't get this. And we're in Luke chapter 24, there were two people who go, I don't get this. I, I don't understand this. I watched him die, and it was a horrible death to watch. And I watched him die. So let's take a look at this story, and then let's figure out what's going on. Because I'm, I, I want us to see, it's important for us to see that God didn't hide from us people who were having some issues of, of, I'm not sure this actually happened. I'm not sure he actually could do that. I watched him die, and it was horrible. How can anyone come back from that? Luke chapter 24. And this is long, but it's, it's a worthy read. We're not going anywhere in the next 15 minutes, right? Hang on. Verse 13 of Luke chapter 24. And behold, two of them 
were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all the things which had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus Himself approached and began traveling with them. Verse 16, But their eyes were prevented from recognizing Him. Verse 17 says, And He said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things that have happened in these past days? And Jesus said to them, What things? At which point they had to be marveled, right? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But also, some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early this morning. And they did not find His body. They came saying that, he had, that they had seen a vision of angels who had said He was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was exactly as the woman had also said. But him they did not see. And he said to him, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village... As, as where they were going, and he acted as though he would go farther. And they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's getting towards evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Verse 31, And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Were our hearts not burning within us when He was speaking to us on the road while He was explaining the Scriptures to us? And they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and and has, has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how He was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Keep going, verse 36. And while they were telling these things, He Himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit, and some, some will say a ghost. And He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands? See my feet? that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it for the joy and were marveling, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? See, that's what we like about Jesus. You want to know that fellowships are good? This is because Jesus is saying, hey, it's okay, we want to eat. That's how fellowships are good. Just kidding. <laughs> He, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. And now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he continued talking to them more the same. Isn't that fascinating? I love that story. I've always loved that story. Because here Jesus just showed up out of the blue, literally, and in his new body he is uninhibited by the physical things. He's a physical body. It's a new body, but it's, it's not bound by physical things. He appeared in their presence. See my hands, see my feet, he said. It's really me. I'm not just a ghost. I'm really the real thing here. And yet, they, they were just amazed at this. Now, it wasn't that Jesus hadn't told them this. He had said on multiple occasions, I will rise on the third day. And he said this to them. He said this to his closest people. His closest people, his followers, the eleven and those that hung with them. And and so they were kind of wrapping their brain around this, if you want to look at it that way. They're going, how how did this happen? Because we expected him, when he rode into Jerusalem last week, we expected him to take kingdom back right then. And yet, 
that didn't happen. And so now they're confused because they were focused only on one thing. They were focused on circumstances. They were looking at the stuff that was happening around them. And they're going, well, this was supposed to happen, and now this happened, and now nothing can happen. Now, now we're in, in trouble here. If he had proclaimed, and let us put it this way, because he had proclaimed, how he had told them and taught them, the people who were closest to him, that he would rise on the third day, well, why were there doubts? Why was there disillusionment? Why did they not get that? Because it's easy for us to sit here and go, well, I don't get why they couldn't get that. I always use this example of me in Algebra 2 and my wrestling coach in high school. He just looked at me and said, why can't you get this? Because I can't. Right? But I wasn't trying hard enough, I guess. So. But sometimes you get stuff that goes, I don't get this. And God will put us into situations we don't get. God will take circumstances of life and wrap us into that. We go, I, I can't get out of this myself, but I don't get it because I thought God was supposed to be on my side, and I don't really feel like he's on my side right now. And so these two people on, on the Emmaus road, Cleopas, and if it was his wife, and some, some of the commentaries think of this, this was his wife, that woman's name was also Mary, and she was friends with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and was standing at the foot of the cross. She watched him die. And it was a horrible death, and she's going, there's no way. We thought this was going to happen, and now this happened. So Jesus walks with them, and he starts telling them all these things they've heard before, but they still didn't even recognize him at that point. So why didn't they recognize him? Why didn't they recognize him? Good question, right? Beginning with Moses, verse 25 through 27 says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them all things concerning himself and the scriptures. And they are still waiting for this aha moment. They go, you know, later we learned, hey, my, my heart was burning on this. I was really connecting with him. I, just, I had goosebumps, but I, I'm still trying to connect here what's going on. But the question is, why did they doubt? And the answer is, I think, because they weren't looking for this. They weren't looking for him to be risen. They, weren't, they were expecting him to be in his kingship position. They weren't looking for the risen Savior. Then because they weren't looking for him, they thought he was dead. And because they thought they were dead, he was still dead. You know, all the, all the joy had gone out of their heart. They, they just, there, 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 there was this thing that happened. They just couldn't wrap their head around. I thought. He was coming to be king. And he was going to restore Israel. I thought all that was going to happen, and none of that happened. And I'm glad God didn't hide that from us. He didn't hide that in his word. He doesn't show only the good stuff. It's like Facebook. You only see the good stuff. The Bible isn't like Facebook, where you only see the good stuff of everybody. God was good enough to show us the doubts and the fears and the worries of his people who were his closest people. You look at David, King David, a man God says, God called him a man after God's own heart. And yet the Psalms are full of, of doubt and depression because he's going, God, where are you? Where are you at? Now, He'll circle back around in those psalms and he'll find God. He'll find God because in the midst of the circumstances, sometimes it's easy to get, what do they call that? Lost in the forest because of the trees. And yet, when we find God, when we reach back out and find God, we go, oh, I got, I got my direction now. I know where he's taking me. There are times in our life that we don't recognize him either right? There's times in our life we don't recognize Him working. Someone has said, when God is silent, He is not still. When He is silent, He is not still. We might not see Him working, but that doesn't mean He's not working. We might not see Him answering prayer when we when we're, we need, need this to happen, but God's still working. He's still working. And because His, amen, Doug, you have a great testimony on waiting on the Lord. Because we don't think like he thinks, and, the, and God was good enough to let us know in Isaiah. He's good enough to let us know, you don't think like I think. 
So when you start putting a time limit on me, it's not my time limit. In fact, Isaiah 55 says, I'm going to tell you how different we are. I love you very much, but here's how different we are. As high as the heavens are, if you can look up as high as the heavens are from the earth where you're standing right now, I think up here and you think down here, and there's no similarity. So when we start putting a time limit on God, it's not his time limit. Now, there's physical circumstances that go, Lord, if you don't show up by thus and such a date, and a bill is due, you have one of two choices. You know, I'm going to wait on him and figure this out, or I'm going to panic. <laughs> right? And, and faith is the activation of stuff we can't see. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And sometimes we have to reach out and grab hold of that, even though I don't see it, but it's that prayer, God, I want you to know that I know you're my only help. You're my only source. You're the only one that's going to get me through. That's a powerful prayer. We might be looking on both sides of the fence. We might be looking, well, you know, I might get some help over here on this side of the fence, but, you know, I got a little bit of God here too, so I don't, I'm going to split the difference here and kind of hope for the best. God's saying, am I it or am I not it? Am I all or not all? Because I can't be part. If you're not going to make me all, I can't really help you. Right? God can use anybody else He chooses to help us. But if we don't look to Him for our source, if we don't look to Him and say, God, I want you to know that I know you are my only source. You are my only help. If we can't get to there, He's going to go, I'm going to help you as much as I can, but I'll only help you as much as you will let me help you. And sometimes... So the question is, why were there doubts and disillusionments? Same reason we have doubts and disillusionments, because sometimes the circumstances scream at us. Right? Because sometimes the circumstances are shouting louder. And we got to get to a place of quiet and go, God, I need your help. It's kind of like this. Generally, when you're not looking for someone, that's what you'll find. Gosh, I wasn't looking for you to show up today. <laughs> you know? Um, if we aren't looking for God, He's not going to show up anyway because we're not calling on Him to come. We're not calling on Him to get involved. We're not saying, Lord, I need you in this situation. So Jesus, instead of showing these people, He didn't reveal Himself. Did you see this? Look at this again. Verse 16, Luke 24, their eyes were pre prevented from recognizing him. Why didn't he just say, look, here, it's me, it's me. Look at my hands. He didn't do that. What did he do? Take a look at what he did. Pull the layer back here and look at what he did. He said, what are the words you are exchanging? Right? In verse 17. And then verse 19, he said, what things? And so they explained to him with their words. Jesus could have at any moment gone, look here, it's me. And he didn't do that. What did he do? Verse 25, he says, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have, what's the word? Spoken. So what value then, if we look at that situation, you break that down, what value... He could have said, it's me. And yet he has greater value on his spoken word. You with me? He could have showed them the physical evidence, and yet he said, no, 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 no. I want you to take a listen to this. He spoke to them, beginning with Moses and the prophets, and he taught them the word. Because here's the deal. We either believe God's word or we don't. And I get, no, please, don't, Reggie McNeil, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that if we don't get it, that we're wrong. 
I'm saying that there's times when we have to reach out in faith and go, I don't get this, Lord. You're going to have to show me. And the Holy Spirit takes whatever time the Holy Spirit needs for us to, to like a fine seed in the soil, cultivate and then start sprouting. You put that seed in the soil and it's like, come on, grow, grow. I need you to grow now. I want to see, this some, I want to see some progress here. But it takes a week, sometimes longer, for a seed to sprout, to see evidence of life. And sometimes that's what it takes for the Holy Spirit to allow that, to, 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 to think about that and see things. And He reinforces and He reinforces. But the bottom line is this. Jesus spoke first His Word. And He said, do you believe what the prophets and what Moses said? Do you believe that? Because at any one moment, He could have said, see, it's me. But He said, no. I want Him to know, do you trust My Word? Do you trust My Word? And that's our question. Do we trust His Word? Do we believe that this is the Word of God in that sense? And from the Word of God that He reveals to Himself to us through His character and His love and His power and His holiness and all these other things that define who He is. So, bottom line is, if we don't get it, it's okay to not get it. The question is, is which side of the fence are we going to look on to get an answer? Dr. J. Vernon McGee, who I really, really love, especially on going through this with um, discipleship and his commentary. I mean, he, Mr. Dr. McGee's been dead for 30 years, so everything he's written was written prior to that. And he's got a great story about this, and, he, and I'm going to read you his quote. So, thinking about the... The, the value that we place as God's people, His disciples, His followers, that we place on the Word of God, listen to what he says. He says, this is a very important section, friend. The Lord, in speaking about His resurrection, did not show them the prints of the nails in His hands to prove it. He referred them to the Scriptures rather than to the nail prints. He told them, you should have believed what the prophets said. It is well to note the Lord's attitude towards the Bible. The day in which we live, and this was 40 years ago, he says, the day in which we live is a day of doubt. There are people who are actually saying you cannot be intelligent and believe the Bible. Many people are afraid that they will not be considered intelligent, so they don't come out flat-footed and say whether they believe in the Bible or not. I suppose it is the most subtle and satanic trap of our day to discount the inerrancy and the integrity of the Word of God. Christ says a man is a fool not to believe it. He gave a unanimous and wholehearted acceptance of the Bible statements with no ifs and or buts. And Dr. McGee continues the other day. This is a fascinating story. He said, the other day I picked up a seminary professor and took him to a filling station because he had car trouble. As we rode along, I asked him about his school's viewpoint of the inerrancy of the Word of God. In other words, he asked him, do you believe that the Bible is infallible? Do you believe, sir, he's asking this man, that the Bible is the absolute Word of God and there are no errors in that? And the man said this, well, he said, you mean the infallibility of the Bible? And I replied, wait a minute. You're arguing semantics. You know exactly what I mean. And I know what you mean. Do you or do you not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture? Well, he wouldn't make a forthright declaration whether he believed or not. He was a seminary professor. He wanted to appear intelligent. And frankly, a lot of these men do not have the intestinal fortitude to stand for the Word of God. I think their problem is more intestinal than intellectual. Translation, they didn't have the guts to say, I believe the Word of God is true. Jesus values His Word. And I guess the question is, do we value it too? Do we value it too? I totally understand this. Valuing it and not fully comprehending and understanding. and Because and, I'm telling you, I, I've, I've heard stuff all my life. And that word is alive. I get stuff today I didn't get 40 years ago. Or 45. Or 50. Um, because it is alive. 
And God is so vast and so real, He will make Himself known to us in the way that we need. It's whether or not we believe that. Do we believe that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think? Or is that just pretty words? Yeah, that's pretty. You know, sometimes we get wrapped up in the intellectualness of it. Understand that you and me and we believing in the Bible doesn't mean we check our intelligence at the door. Because God is an intelligent God. Knowledge comes from Him. Wisdom comes from Him. And there's not a checking of our intelligence at the door. It's just faith sometimes, because He's not like us, because He's different than us, because He doesn't think like us, <coughs> we can be intelligent and go, I don't understand this at all. How far is that star away from here? Well, it's light years from here. So His thinking is light years different than us. And yet, that doesn't mean we have to check our intelligence at the door. And so, with that, do, without belief that He will do what He says, without the belief that He will do what He says, or without the belief that He can do what He says, the Christian life is going to be less than victorious. It's going to be less than satisfying. It's going to be less than fulfilling. Because we're going to go, I don't know if He can or not. In fact, you know, I got a little bit here and I got a little bit there. I got foot on either side. And it's like, I want some God stuff in there. But, but you know, you know, well, this is the 21st century, man. There's some other stuff out here maybe I should take a look at. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please Him. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to everyone who believes. So, God speaking about His Word... And again, we're looking at followers who are going, I'm having some doubts here. And I'm saying, it's okay. It's okay. The question is, what are we looking for? What, do our faith is, what is our faith in to move us forward? Austin, uh, flip to a couple different screens here. There is a debate right now whether or not God is meaning what he says, about hell. And I'm going to throw this out as the last example today. Because in evangelical circles, there was a, a preacher out of Michigan, Michigan, I think, Rob Bell, who made a declaration and wrote a book about six or seven years ago. says, there is no hell. This is a man who was ordained in the Word of God. And he said, no, there's no hell. God didn't mean that. So you don't have to worry about it. Hell is just the hard stuff we go through in this life, and there is no hell. God's not going to condemn anyone to hell, which is not true. And he was on Fox News at the time, and I don't know what this lady who was interviewing him believed in. She took it to him. <laughs> well, what about the Bible that says this, and what about the Bible that says that? And he was kind of going backwards a little bit on walking that back. And then here in the last two weeks, the Pope came out and said, you know, there's no hell. It's like, that's not true. So there are hell deniers as well. And, you know, it's not that... <coughs> Hold on. It's not that... I, I, we all have things that we go, I, I'm not sure I understand that. And all I'm saying is it's okay to go, I don't get, I'm not sure that I get it, and it's okay. As long as we're seeking God out. Do we trust His Word? How much do we trust His Word? As a follower, if we say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, then how much trust do we put in His Word? Because He values His Word. Does He value the physical circumstances? Yes. Got nail holes. But He values, values His Word. Let me leave you with this. Guys, come on back. The best thing that we have is God telling us what He thinks. John 20, 
verses 26 through 29 says, After eight days the disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus came in, the doors actually having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Hey, Thomas, reach here and put your finger in my, in my hands. Reach here and put your, put your hand in my side so that you believe. You said you weren't going to believe unless you could do that, Thomas. I heard you say that, Thomas. So, go ahead. You want physical evidence? Here's your physical evidence. And Thomas says, verse 28, he said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Because you've seen me, now you believe? Blessed are they who haven't seen and yet believe. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Psalm 33. For the word of God is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. By the word of God, the heavens were made. So when it says, he spoke it into existence, he spoke it into existence, he meant that. He revealed that much of himself to us. Let me tell you how I did this. I spoke it into existence. Revelation 22. Austin, next one. Revelation 22, verses 6 and 7. It says, he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of spirit, of the spirits of the prophets, sent His angel to show His bondservant the things much, which must soon to take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is He who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. And one more, Austin. Psalm 119. This is a little bit long. I pulled verse 11. Verse 11 is the pull quote out of that. But it says this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander far from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. (coughs) Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all the riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your status. I shall not forget your word. I won't forget your word. So what's the Lord saying to you? We started this with a question. What is the Lord saying to you? He's got a word for you. From His word, He has a word for you. From His word, He's saying something to you today. You came here looking for something. You came here looking for something. And worship is finding from God what you came looking for. What is He saying to you? What will you do about it? What is he saying to you? To some, (coughs) maybe he's saying, my peace I leave with you. And in faith, we can take that and go, it's crazy out there. I like it right here. I like 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's peaceful. I don't want to leave at 11.15 because it's not peaceful out there. But he's saying, my peace I leave with you. And if he leaves it with you, you can take it with you go to some he's saying trust me you can trust me I'd be here all day telling you how we trust God in the midst of being broke you'd be amazed at how much mac and cheese five dollars will buy and you can live on or rice and beans because of the provision of the Lord And sometimes it's like, wow, steak would have been good, but I'm really happy with rice and beans right now. I'm I'm thrilled with that. Thank you very much for that provision. Maybe he's saying to you, what are you going to do with me? I don't know what your heart is. I don't know what you've done with Jesus. I'm going to turn around this one because I don't want anybody to think I'm looking at him. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what are you going to do about that? What what will you do about that? The Bible says today 
is the day of salvation. Because I'm going to tell you this, and I will turn around and tell you this, there is no promise of tomorrow. I have friends I grew up with that aren't here now. And I'm not that old. We have no promise of tomorrow. What are you doing with God? Have you made Him Savior? And will you make Him Lord? Some people have made Him Savior and haven't made Him Lord. And you go, I don't see God working. It's because you haven't made Him Lord. You want me to tell you the truth or you want me to lie to you? It's because you haven't made Him Lord. Today, as our old preacher used to say, this is your hour of decision. What's God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? You can feel the Holy Spirit in this place today. Because the Spirit is here because He's trying to talk to somebody. He wants to connect with you. God wants relationship with us. He wants that. He loves to have relationship with us. And He's saying, get on this side of the fence so we, you can run with me on this side of the fence. You can't run straddling the fence. And you can't be with me on the other side. Come on this side. Because I want to be with you. Would you stand? I don't do this very often. Because I don't want to wear it out. And I don't want to heap guilt on people where there's no guilt needed to be heaped. But I'm telling you, I feel this today. If you need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, come on down. If you say, you know what, I've made him Savior. I just really need to make him Lord. Do it now. What's God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? I'm not going to look at anybody. What's God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? He's calling today. He's calling today. Come on. Come on down. I guarantee you, we won't make you stand down here by yourself. There will be people come pray with you. Steve, I